if you'll turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the fifth chapter, we're going to take a look at another opportunity of understanding the church and the church's position in the world, who we are and what we are to be. Last week, we took a look at uh, part of the Lord's Prayer about uh, your will, uh, O God, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next week, we're going to take, be taking a look at the church in authority and what it means to have spiritual authority of Christ. And uh, I don't think that we really understand the power that Christ has given to us uh, to make decisions here on earth and to uh, do great things. So come again next Sunday for that. But this morning, what I'd like to take a look at is the mystical union that we share as the church, the body of Christ, and also how we worship God in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, I think these will be very practical words uh, taken from the scriptures. As we see in Ephesians 5, Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus and giving instructions for them and to us about how to live as Christ's followers in the world today uh, and what it means to be a part of that church. In fact, the book of uh, Ephesians has much to do with the church and its community and its uh, communion that it shares. So turn with me, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Listen to the word of the Lord. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are not proper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases God. The Lord, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I do believe that what Paul was telling the church is to sing the songs. But what he meant by that was not just singing as though we're singing a hymn in church in a sanctuary, but our lives are to be a song and out of our hearts are to be moments of gratitude to God. And the songs that we live, the songs that we sing are to be sung in everyday moments. How? By by the way we live our lives. Singing has always been an important aspect of the church as you know. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to visit an elderly woman in a skilled nursing facility. She was over 100 years old. I I can't remember the exact, 103, 105, something around that age group. And I was amazed as I sat with her and we talked for a bit. And though her body was very fragile, her mind was as sharp as could be. And she remembered and recalled events in histories, in history, her life and uh, in this world that just surprised me with her quickness. But she also had the ability to remember things in the present as well. She was as sharp as could be. And there we were talking with each other. It was before what I did. Every Tuesday I would go over to the skilled nursing facility and I'd play the keyboards and we'd sing with the residents that were there. And uh, as I talked to the lady and the people began coming in, we started this hymn sing service, if you will. I had asked the people, what song selections would you like to do? Immediately, the woman I had been talking to, the woman who was well over 100 years old, said, oh, can we sing Amazing Grace? 
I just love that song, one of my favorites. In fact, I remember standing in front of my church on the plains in the Midwest when I was a little girl of about five years old. And I sang to the congregation these words. And I said to her, of course we'll start with Amazing Grace. I like that song too. And so I began to play the piano, gave the introduction. And as I did, I saw this woman lean her head back and close her eyes and just smile. And we began the first stanza. We all sang Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And as we sang that, I happened to look up at this woman and she opened her eyes for a moment and her eyes locked. And in that very moment, a very spiritual moment, I was sucked into something. I don't even know how to explain it. In fact, what I'm about to tell you will make no sense at all unless you've experienced it yourself. It would seem as though I'm about to exaggerate something or embellish on something that took place, but I'm not. In that moment, as our eyes locked to begin the second verse, we began singing it, and somehow I felt myself transported in time. And there, in a moment, as my fingers went across the keyboard and we sang the second stanza of the song, there I was in the church in the Midwest with this woman. And I looked up at the front of the, of the sanctuary, and there was the little five-year-old girl singing Amazing Grace. As soon as we finished the song, it was gone again. But in that brief moment, we had this mystical, supernatural experience. We crossed over time and dimensions. It it reminded me, I remember thinking about this, of the moment that Jesus was on the mountain of transfiguration. And in one moment, Jesus was there. And the next moment, there were two people with him who had died 800 and 1,000 years before Jesus was on that mountain. But they were all there together at the same time with Jesus speaking to him of his sacrifice and what he would do in Jerusalem. You see, in Jesus, there is this moment where we're brought together as the church. There's a mystical communion that we share in him. And when we sing together, when we join together, when we have this thing that the Bible calls koinonia in the Greek, which means fellowship, we belong to Jesus who is eternal and we somehow experience that eternity. The church is connected not just in unity with our sisters and brothers all over the world right now, but we're joined together with all those who have ever lived and who now live eternally with God. Think about that for a moment. This moment as you are sitting wherever you are and I'm standing here in Burbank and we we are sharing a fellowship that is so profound that even if though it's on social media, it doesn't matter. We are joining together with all of creation in in worshiping Jesus. The early church would get together, the, the very early church, and they'd sing in Rome in the catacombs, and they'd come together in secret because they were frightened because of the persecution they were facing, but also, more importantly, because they knew they wanted to be at the tombs because it helped them remember that they were joined together with those who had crossed over to the other side, that the veil is very thin, and in Jesus Christ as they worshiped, they were one. And they had that taste of eternity. In Hebrews 12, it says, this comes from the early church, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. The church, as a union of the people of God, brings us into a glorious company. A woman named Megan Hill once wrote an article, and she says these words, and I agree with her. Though, when we come to church, though they may look ordinary from the outside, the people of our local church have their names written in heaven, Luke 10. But it's not only these ordinary and yet extraordinary saints who join us for worship. When we assemble as the church, we join the whole host of heaven. That's what we're doing right now wherever you're at, because we're joined together in our worship of putting Jesus, who was the door to heaven, putting him first, we are somehow joined together. If the Lord could open our eyes for just one moment, we would see what Elisha's servant saw. In 2 Kings chapter 6, he saw a great company of those from the eternal realm who were already there. 
If our eyes could be open for a moment, we would see that even these creatures and people who ever lived worshiping God right now, that they delight in the preached word. First Peter 1. They rejoice when sinners repent and believe because of it. Luke chapter 15. They testify to the value of even the weakest worshiper. Matthew 18, as Jesus said. Commanded by Christ to minister to his beloved children. Listen to this. Psalm 91, Hebrews 1 say, the angels never miss, miss, or indicates, the angels never miss a worship service. Right now, wherever you are, there are angels surrounding us, praising Jesus. And we have the opportunity to join with them because of the mystical union we share in the communion of the saints. Not only does our worship gather, gathering and singing and however we do it, we'll welcome the angels. It also welcomes every true worshiper from every previous age. You see, these are the people who, while they were here on earth, they were the righteous who are now made perfect. They are the cloud of witnesses we read about in the Bible. They testify to the greatness of the One whom we worship. And by faith they knew Him as worthy when they worshipped in their chairs, in their pews, in their seats at home like ours. And now they proclaim Him as worthy by sight. You see, when we come together and worship, if we come together and we don't realize that we join with the angels and all those who have gone before us, and, and perhaps even those who will come after us, the mystical union that we share in Jesus, then we'll all of a sudden begin thinking of church in ways that are old and tired and not workable. But it's exciting, this mystical union. Be encouraged. God is here. And this is the mystery the Apostle Paul understood. In the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us what it means to be followers of Jesus, how we are to live our lives, but to live it in community with all those who proclaim the name of Jesus. In our passage in chapter 5, quick overview of what he said, what I just read a few moments ago. He wants us to mature as the people of God with one another. And so he says these things. Follow God's example. Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us by sacrificing Himself. No sexual immorality because this will hurt your relationship with God and with others. No impurity or greed should be found among you because these things are improper for God's people. Don't be crude or rude because you and I represent Jesus. How would he speak and think? Don't be quick to listen to empty words. Don't partner with those who deceive. Because God is going to judge all things. And we don't want to be on that wrong side when the Lord does judge. Paul reminds us, you and I were once darkness. But now we're light. We are in the light. We're called to expose the darkness for what it is, not bathe in it. And then Paul says this beautiful phrase in our chapter. He says, find out what pleases the Lord. Wow. Find out what pleases the Lord. Then do it. So much of our lives are uh, attempts to find out what pleases us. Paul says, find out what pleases God. And for those who follow Jesus, there is a desire, a passion to find out what pleases God himself. I used to have a friend, we would uh, talk, we'd walk around, we'd do things together, and just at the most unexpected times, he would stop and he'd look up to heaven and say, how am I doing, Father? It was odd for me. I thought, that's a strange thing to do, especially in public, but he didn't care. How am I doing, Father? That's what Jesus heard in his ministry. How am I doing, Father? And three times we find in the Bible... God the Father spoke about His Son Jesus and said, You are my beloved Son and You I am well pleased. And God was not shy to secretly whisper that to Jesus. God thundered. The Heavenly Father thundered in the atmosphere. You are my Son. I am well pleased with You. And I imagine that for Jesus. Put a smile to His face as He went on His way to do the next piece of ministry. Is that your passion? Friends, I can promise you that when you know God's pleasure upon your life, you will want nothing else. It is so precious. It is comforting. It is so inspiring. 
And by the way, what I hope I can remind you of week after week is this. Your heavenly Father is so very fond of you. It's our sin that gets in the way of knowing that. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul gave this instruction to the Ephesians and to us. Don't walk in the ways of this world, but learn what pleases your heavenly Father. And when you realize it, you, all you'll want to do is please your heavenly Father because it brings life to the soul. It is the air that we breathe. And when we know God's pleasure, we don't want the darkness anymore. When we know God's pleasure and favor upon our lives, we don't want to be crude or rude or coarse in our words or actions. But there's a key that Paul leaves in there. The power of the passage hinges on this one thing. That we can't walk in these ways unless we understand. Did you see it? The act of being thankful. Being thankful is what puts everything on its right course. Are you having trouble with your situations in life? Are you caught up in the worries of this world? Do you feel isolated, alone, and depressed? Give thanks to God and see what happens. You don't have to start big. Just something small. Watch how it grows into greater gratitude. Oh God, thank you this day for life. Oh God, thank you for my family. Oh God, thank you for my church family. God, thank you for my friends. Or perhaps it's even... God, thank you that it's not always just, it's not always going to be this way. Whatever it is, start small and you unleash the power of God in your life to live as a victor. You may not feel like giving thanks at all this morning and maybe 99% of your life is not so good. But friends, we need a better focus. We need to open the door, even just a little crack to let that gratitude come in, that, that, the light come in. Watch how the darkness flees. And here's why I know this is powerful for the passage. Because when Paul wrote these words, he was in jail. Much of the Apostle Paul's life was in jail, isolated, alone, darkness. Many years he spent in jail. In this particular instance, he's writing in Rome and he'll be there for two years in jail. And people will come by and visit him. And he'll encourage them and they'll encourage him. But he was isolated. And yet he still could write these words about living a holy life and doing so with gratitude to God for everything. Maybe in this time, what is overarching in your life is the pressure of the pandemic. All of us experience it. All of us know what it's like to be isolated. All of us get frustrated with the new orders we hear every day. Now what are we supposed to do? Why can't this thing go away? Oh God, why can't you just heal the world and take and, and abolish the virus? And friends, I don't know why, but I know that God is good. And it drives me to look back at the church over the history. And as somebody who loves history, what I note is this. Pandemics have occurred time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. This is the first time in our life that we've experienced something like this. But for more than 2,000 years, the church has gone through this. There have been times the church was not able to meet in person. Remember I mentioned going to the graveyards, hiding and protecting themselves from the enemy at which we're the persecutors? Well, now our persecutor is the virus. And so what do we do? Well, we learn our history. Because what we learn in history is this, that over the last 2,000 years, the church has always stood fast to the words of Jesus. And what does he say? Well, they, they, they held on to their moral as this, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Greater love has, has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. It was always an attitude in the church of sacrifice and service. When the terrible Antonine plague took place in Rome in the second century, friends, I want to go through every plague in history, but I can't do that for the sake of time. Let me just highlight a couple of them as we look at how we can be like the church in history over the plagues. In the second century, one quarter of the population of Rome was going to be decimated and destroyed. And at that moment, when the pandemic hit, the Christians stepped up. When people fled, the Christians stayed and nursed people to health. They never talked about their rights. 
They talked about their help and the way they protect other people. And as a result, in that time, the Antonine Plague in the second century, after the plague was over, there was an explosion of people who wanted to come into the church because they saw the love of these Christians who cared not for their rights and their life, but for the sacrifice of other people to protect them and help them. In the third century, there was another plague so devastating that historians think it was an outbreak of Ebola. As a result, Christians who cared for their neighbors and nursed them to health and also protected from further infection, an explosion occurred yet again. A people who said, is this what the church is about? I want to be a part of it. And Christians did not demand their rights. They sacrificed themselves for the sake of others. I'm going to have to skip up, but let's go to the 14th century. You know the plague in the 14th century, the bubonic plague, that decimated one-fourth of Europe. 40 million people died, estimates have said, in three years. History notes that there were two responses of the church during this time. There were a group of people who called themselves Christians, and what they did is they began being so frustrated that this, the bubonic plague was there, they began criticizing everyone for causing it. Who's to blame? They blamed the governors, and they blamed their, their, their kings and their rulers, and they wanted to find out, and they began to blame the Jews. And they fled. And they cared about themselves more than they cared about others. And that people caused divisions. And they separated cultures and creeds and religions. Yet friends, on the other side, there were people who took care of their neighbors. Pope Clement VI actually, during the bubonic plague, commanded that Avignon in France should be opened up, open its gates to the poor Jewish refugees because they had no place to go. And I can tell you as a historian, looking back at the time period, here's how history judges that moment. Those who opened their doors, those who protected others and nursed them to health are seen as the heroes. And those who did not and demanded their rights are seen as the villains. In the 16th century, I'll end with this one. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was in the middle of a pandemic in Germany and everybody turned to him and said, what do we do? The plague has come. And Luther wrote tracts and started saying how Christians, you should not be leaving your towns and and, and protecting yourselves and isolating yourselves. What you should be doing is being present and making sure people are okay. In a letter to Reverend Dr. John Hess, which is found in Luther's works, volume 43, here's what Luther says when asked how he would respond. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate Help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me. And I I have done what he expected of me, and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. But if my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it neither is brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. I hope by now you see that during the time of the plagues in history for more than 2,000 years, the noble and heroic response of those who follow Jesus to love thy neighbor to take care of their community was seen in many people. And friends, what I'd like to say at this time is this may be the most important and vital time in history for us. And how we respond to this plague will either show that we demand our rights or that we serve others with a sacrificial love. We isolate ourselves so that we don't endanger the hundred-year-old woman who's, who's fragile and could die. We wear our masks because it's not about me. 
It's about not wanting them to suffer. And friends, I believe we're at a vital point in history. I know we're frustrated. I know we've shut the doors of the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, but the church has never closed. We will continue to preach and teach and do Bible study and have communion. And friends, we'll sing together through social media. And we'll sing with our hearts to God. Because when we do, it doesn't have to be in a sanctuary. But listen to this. When we sing with each other, there is a beautiful mystical communion that takes place. I remember several years ago singing with a woman who was in well over a hundred years of age. And in the second stanza of the beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the, 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 how sweet the sound. I was sucked into a time that I had no right to be. I was there in 1905, 10, whenever it was. In the middle of the Midwest, in a church, because when we share in the love of Jesus and we sing to Him, friends, we are brought together and we are way beyond time and space. Let's sing all the verses together. Let's be the church that God called us to be. A church that is sacrificial. That shows a love just as Jesus did. Because there's a world all around us that needs to know first and foremost that we love them and we'll protect them. And we're going to help them. Amen.